Okay, today's lecture is dedicated to the single Jordan block. If you recall the previous lectures, you will you might remember that uh, we spend a lot of time dealing with um, uh, nilpotent inheritance operators uh, in case you know, when the eigenvalue is constant. The thing is here. The thing here is that it turns out that the case when eigenvalue is not constant is way more complicated. You see, before, like, like up until now, all the normal forms we had to deal with, they were like similar to the linear algebra, right? When we were talking about uh, Jordan block, we were talking about Jordan block, like zeros and ones above the diagonal and something stands on the diagonal. Uh, Non-constant eigenvalue is the first example when actually you do not have uh, the normal form which looks like the normal form from the um, linear algebra. It's important difference. This, this uh, topic shows that Ninhuis geometry, it's not just simply linear algebra plus Ninhuis integration uh, condition, like vanishing of Ninhuis torsion. It is something uh, a little bit uh, more interesting. Okay. Okay. So, uh, for now, let us assume that we have an, uh, an inheritance operator L with single eigenvalue and it's not constant. It may be constant, it may be not constant, but non-constant is a more general case. We will see that the normal form for non-constant eigenvalues transforms into the normal form for constant eigenvalues when you just put lambda to be constant. But for now, we can see that lambda is not constant. What is the problem here? The problem here is that this operator, L lambda, see, it's L minus lambda times identity. Basically, what we do is we, uh, like, subtract the diagonal uh, thing point-wise, and we get a new potent operator. Uh, there is a, uh, is new potent, it's not related to L, it's L lambda is new potent. So it's a new potent operator, but the thing is, that uh, Nihus torsion of this operator is not zero because we have a non-constant eigenvalue. We use this property that we have a, uh, in Nihus operator when we reduce the case of uh, uh, constant eigenvalues to the case of nilpotent operators, okay. But we do have a nice formula, which, you, which was proved earlier, I think in lecture two. And this formula, look at this, it uh, shows that we might expect something good. We still, uh, like from this uh, operator L lambda, we still have some uh, flag of distribution, the similar as we had before, because L lambda is, nil is nilpotent. So we have um, the distribution of images. If you remember for L lambda being constant, uh, those distributions were integrable. It turns out that, it turns out that in our case, these distributions are also integrable. See, it's not obvious because we do not have um, uh, vanishing of Nienhoff's torsion. But it turns out that these distributions are integrable. This is the first theorem we're going to prove, and we will heavily use it uh, throughout uh, the later section. Okay, so how do we prove it? Well, we start... As usual, we take a pair of basis vector fields, right? And we uh, calculate the following formula. If you want to prove that the image is integrable, right? Uh, what you need to do? You need to prove, you need to check the condition of a Frobenius theorem. Frobenius theorem says that if you, you need to take two uh, vector fields from the image, uh, make, take a comm commutator of these vector fields and these Commutator should lie in a space spanned by these uh, vector fields, right? So uh, the distribution must be closed under the commutator. Now, the thing you can pick here is the vector fields that generate the distribution. What are vector fields here? We take the most simple ones. We take basis vector fields, right? And we apply L lambda. So we get a bunch of vector fields. Some of them might be linearly dependent because the uh, rank of L lambda drops. Right, but it does not matter. We still have uh, vector fields, and if we have more than enough vector fields, and they still are closed under the commutation, everything's fine. So that's what we're going to do. We take this commutator and we write 
uh, we substitute a formula for L lambda and we open the brackets. See, that's what we get. This is We just opened the brackets, did nothing here. Now, what can we see here? The red part, the red part is the thing from Nihio distortion. We remember that Nihio distortion of L vanishes and we can rewrite it like this. This equals to this. This is exactly the Nihio distortion vanishing, right? You take three terms from the left and bring it to the other side. Okay, uh, now we, t we look at blue one, blue and green, they give us this condition and this condition. And then we have a black one, which is which gives us this condition. Now we gather the, the similar terms, right? Here it is, here it is, here it is. Now, what can we... Look at this. This is, is nothing else but L star lambda applied to D lambda. That is exactly the formula we had here, see? Uh, the lower indices means that we take uh, this differential form, we take this differential form and take the jth uh, coordinate of this differential form in this formula, because we need two lower uh, coordinates. Okay, that is, uh, so that's exactly what we get. So this is zero and this is zero, because again, this formula was proved in um, uh, lecture two, I think in lecture two. So these two vanish and we get the following formula. Look, we took two vector fields from the image, we commuted them and we got some vector field applied L to L lambda to it and another vector field applied L lambda to that. The right hand side lies in the image, right? So the vector fields L lambda, they span the image, so in general. And thus, we, we have shown that one image, right? We are trying to prove that all the images for all the powers, they are um, integrable. We've just shown that one image is integrable and we got this nice formula for basis vector fields. If you don't, if you take not basis vector fields, then you will have this uh, one more uh, condition here. It's, it does not vanish, see it's zero because those vector fields commute and if those are arbitrary vector fields, that this part does not vanish. So you will get slightly different, more complicated formula. Okay, step two. Now we need to do the invariant, uh, uh, now we need to do some uh, work with uh, distributions. Okay, let us recall that we did, we spent quite some time in the previous section, what we did there, we uh, carefully investigated uh, the L invariant distributions and we discussed if you have an operator, then you can re restrict L onto the distribution and you will get an inhere separator, but which is more important, uh, you can um, restrict, uh, you can obtain a quotient operator if you remember, right? The quotient operator means that if you uh, take the quotient space, if you have distribution, it is L invariant distribution and you have a quotient space, the quotient space is a space of the leaves, of the inter integral leaves of the distribution then this quotient space has a natural structure of uh, manifold if you if your distribution was integrable and uh, on this manifold if you have you can have a quotient operator we discussed that this uh, condition the existence of quotient operator it, it is independent from the vanishing of the inherent distortion it's different and if this quotient operator exists then in the, the original operator was Nihus operator, then the quotient operator is Nihus operator. It's Nihus torsion vanishes, okay? So uh, that is what we're gonna do. We see that image of L lambda squared lies in the image of L lambda, it's smaller, right? So uh, what can, how can we imagine this situation? We can imagine like this, we have a neighborhood of a point. It is foliated into the leaves of images, right? But if we take images squared, then each leaf has its own foliation, right? It is foliated into the smaller leaves. At least that is what we want, want to prove because we want to have an integrable distribution. If L squared is integrable distribution, then each leaf has a natural distribution, right? This is just simply the restriction of the distribution uh, of uh, uh, L squared lambda onto a distribution of image L uh, lambda, and this distribution must be integrable. So, uh, the so we reduce the question to the following. We take this 
integrable distribution. We restrict it onto the already existing leaves. And we want to check is if this distribution is integrable. Okay, let's look at it. If we take the restriction of the operator, not the quotient of the operator, we will, uh, I did that reminding about quotients because we will need it later for much greater purpose. But for now, if we restrict operator on each leaf, it is knee inherits. What is more important? If we restrict operator on each leaf, then um, uh, the uh, eigenvalue lambda, it becomes constant, see? Because this condition, this condition, here it is, implies, this condition implies, right? Because this uh, L lambda, it implies that the leaves, the leaves, right? They lie, lie in the, um, in the surfaces which spent by lambda equals constant. See, this is simply this condition because this equals to zero means that the image of this operator, see, it just lies, it's, uh, D lambda applied to the image is always zero. So what we see here is this formula plus our uh, discussion. Uh, earlier we get that the operator now has constant eigenvalues, right? So we do have constant eigenvalues. E, and now we have an operator with constant eigenvalues. And um, we see that uh, constant eigenvalue and operator in here. So we can apply uh, the previous result, which we used in the, pre in, which we obtained in the previous lecture, right? In, in the lecture six, I think. Yes. And we apply this result and we get that all the um, images, they are integrable. So see, so the proof, the proof looks like this. The first step requires some calculation, right? Because we need to prove that this, distribution is integral, but as soon as we get this integrable distribution, we restrict the operator on this distribution, and the question becomes the ones we have already solved. The question of the linear, of the Nienhe separator with constant eigenvalues. Okay, so now this proves, uh, this completely proves the theorem because now we do have this uh, slicing of each leaf into small leaves, and uh, we can go on and on, and we get the um, uh, flag of integrable distributions, the one we wanted. So, uh, if we have uh, L has single, uh, it should be, it should say, it should say single real eigenvalue, taking coordinate system adapted to the flag of images, right? It means that we take a coordinate system, which first coordinates are, mm, the, the last, the last coordinates are uh, in the image, and then we go up adding number of r i number of coordinates for using this formula. See, so we just see how this, uh, how the the number of coordinates in each group is the change in the dimension of the image of our operator. And then in this uh, in this coordinate system, which will look really simple. We get the operator is upper triangle form. It means it is the similar as if we subtracted that we, it means that L lambda is an upper is strictly upper triangular form. It means that it's nilpotent, right? It's not a normal form. It's not a normal form because we do not know nothing about those things that stand here in star. And we do not expect uh, to solve this problem as general, right? But we know that in case of uh, a constant eigenvalue, we did have a really nice uh, example, really nice thing going on when we had a Jordan block. Jordan block is nice because for it, the image and the kernels, they kind of coinc coincide for different uh, powers, if you remember, like the image of the operator coincides with the kernel of the same operator in the power n minus one. So because of that, all the kernels were integrable and we automatically got that the Jordan block can be brought, brought to the constant form. Today we'll try to bring up Jordan block with non, non uh, we study Jordan block with non-constant eigenvalue. Okay, so this is just a simple notation. We have this operator, it's in upper triangular form, and we see if we have a Jordan normal form, right? Like we have a um, Jordan block of maximal size, then each R1, R2, R new, they actually equal, it equals to one, 
right? Because every time you multiply the Jordan block by itself, its it kernel increases by one, its image decreases by one. So we have that all these R i's, they all are one and new equals to n. And we have just uh, lumb lumped on a diagonal and upper triangle form like this. So this is like the first pre normal form what we can get if we have a new in here separator then we can bring it to this upper triangle form it may it might be useful it might be not useful but okay well, that is how we start but we want some more we want a very specific form to have as much zeros and as much uh, constants <clears throat> and as simple looking normal form as possible so we proceed here is the main theorem See, that's what I was actually talking about. If you remember in the beginning, I said that this is the first case when we deal with a normal form which does not look like normal form from linear algebra. Here, we see exactly that. We see that uh, we have a part that looks like a regular Jordan block, right? This part of smaller size. It has lambda on diagonal and is ones above the diagonal. But then we have a last column and last row, which do not look like a Jordan block. Here we have lambda, yes, of course. And here we have one. But if, you, if we go up, then these functions, they are not zero, right? And moreover, if we uh, assume that lambda is not constant, then it is an e interesting exercise to check. Then if you write an operator like this, lambda on diagonals, uh, ones, above the diagonal and these are zeros just you imagine that you have a normal jordan form with the eigenvalue uh, which depends on lambda uh, 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 with eigenvalue lambda which depends on some coordinates and if you take this jordan form and look at it you will see and check its uh ninja distortion you will you will see that it's it's ninja distortion does not vanish for non-constant lambda See, it will vanish only if lambda equal, is constant. And that is a surprising result because, again, uh, at first sight, when we dealt with a new distortion, it looked like, well, take an operator, you know, something from linear algebra, apply the vanishing of new distortion, and you get the local normal form. This is not the case. That is why it's so cool. Okay, because you can, like, uh, it's, it's not easy to come up with a theorem because you do not know how it looked like. And now through the course of proof, we will see that it is kind of counterintuitive. So let's start with the proof. It's, it's really fun. Okay, so we want to prove this theorem, right? The, uh, we do uh, use our standard approach. We go by the induction, right? We by induction in dimension because we have a, a Jordan block. It goes up and up and goes, or, or, or it increases by one. So the algebraic part is simple. So we start by induction, okay. The basis of induction is two. Okay, so let's start with dimension two. Okay, everything's fine here. And it turns out that in dimension two, you can like go straight ahead. You take uh, an operator, you bring it to the upper triangular form. We discussed it earlier, right? You can do that because we have a, uh, we have a, the distributions are integrable. So we get this upper triangular form. Here we have lambda, here we have zero, here we have G1, okay. Now, in lecture four, I think, for dimension two, you have, uh, you have discussed, you have calculated that an in his condition is equivalent to the different condition. Uh, uh, to, to, in his condition is equivalent to the following mat matrix form. We have a, uh, it, it is, it's supposed, it's supposed to be trace and determinant here, but determinant is lambda squared and trace is two lambda. So uh, I divided by two from the start and this is D of half of the trace and this is D half of the uh, determinant, right? And this they supposed to equal, and we get the following formula. Okay, we have, an inter we have a condition that this operator is similar to the Jordan block in our neighborhood, in our neighborhood of, uh, in our coordinates. So G1, can, cannot vanish because if it vanishes, we have a diagonal operator which is proportional to the identity. It's not a Jordan block, right? So G1 does not vanish. And in this formula, this, this stands for the derivative of lambda in X1. We'll see that if G1 does not vanish, 
then these lambda uh, derivative in lambda must vanish. And it must vanish identically because G1 is not uh, one uh, is not zero at every point. So it, it must vanish identically. We see already that these things like become interesting, right? Suddenly lambda cannot depend on X1. It's supposed to, it, it can depend only on X2. We've seen it in the statement of the theorem, but okay. Uh, it's always fun to check uh, by ourselves. So, okay, we know that lambda, it depends on x2 now. Uh, now we can try and come up with a coordinate change on our own. Like, don't use any theory, no quotient operators and stuff like that. Let's try and do coordinate change, right? First of all, we cannot change coordinate x2 because lambda depends on x2. Uh, if we change it, it will look bad because our normal form implies that it's supposed to depend on x2. Okay, so we leave this function untouched. But then we can have, a, we have another function and we just do the coordinate change. Here is the formula. Here's the formula. So uh, I wrote it the inverse coordinate change, right? So I, I wrote that if we would have, would have done the coordinate change other direction, see, because it's supposed to be the Jacobian uh, minus one, a Jacobian in power minus one should be here, but Jacobian in power minus one, because we did the opposite coordinate change. It just the Jacobian for the coordinate change like this, uh, for, for Jacobian matrix of this. And this is the inverse. It's just, it's just straightforward calculation. If you take this matrix and you try to inverse it, you get this matrix simply. You multiply them and you get the following conditions. See? Good. So what do we have? We have that uh, F uh, lambda X1 must just be equal to G1. There is no uh, integrability, uh, no integrability issues here. We just pick um, F to be anti-derivative of G1 in X1, just integrate it or whatever. And it, it always exists. And we see that the, the coordinate change is good because uh, F, um, the derivative of F in X1, it's just equal to G1. We see G1 is not zero. So this Jacobi matrix does not, it does not vanish. It, it's non-degenerate. Everything is fine. So what we did, again, we tried to come up with the F Right, straightforward, like with brute force. We just wrote the formulas, equated both sides, and saw that the, this uh, formula exists. And we see that in this case, right, we can make the G1 equals to one. So basically in dimension two, if we try and if we look at dimension two as an example and think, well, what happens in dimension three? I don't know, maybe it goes again like this, like, Supposed to be lambda here, one here, zero here, and stuff like this. And what is surprising that it's not. Okay, so we proved the normal. For, we proved the form of the complicated formula in dimension. Now we can proceed to the next. Uh, 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 to the next slide, which is, it looks better than the previous one, because something happened with the previous one. Okay, now, um, okay. Now we assume that uh, we have proved, we have proved our theorem in case of n, and we want to prove it in case of n plus one. Do the induction step. How do we do that? Okay, we take the kernel, uh, which coincides with the image, and we take an adopted coordinate system. Uh, it's L lambda, it means that the first uh, vector field, the first coordinate vector field, must be killed off by L lambda. It means that here we have a long column uh, which consists of zeros, right? If we go back to L, then it has lambda in the beginning. So what do we have here? It looks like square matrix. It's not. We have a lambda in the corner. That's one number. We have a column of zeros. We have M. It's a long matrix. It has its, uh, its sizes are one times N. N, N, which has N times N sizes, right? So we have uh, something like this. So when we earlier obtained the following, that's the formula exactly which we discussed when we're trying to prove that the image is integrable. So this is the formula for the image. Uh, and we have proved that this formula holds. So we apply it, we just take this and we uh, expand this formula for this one because here uh, uh, the calculation is rather simple. Uh, we know that uh, uh, we 
uh, see that this is uh, this yields us if we do the commutation this will be the derivative of lambda uh, or multiplied by the vector field uh, d uh, partial x if we apply l lambda it gives us zero so what we get is we get the following formula. See, we need to take a lambda. This means this is zero here and apply to this vector field. What is important? Important is that if we take uh, this submatrix of a lambda, we'll see that its rank is maximal because, well, the rank of the entire matrix is n plus one. Again, this is the induction step. We have a um, n time m n plus one times n plus one matrix. We subtracted lambda and we get the column of zeros. But we know if we subtract the lambda because each, in each point we have a Jordan block, then the rank of the matrix is supposed to be n. We have a zero column, which means that these, the rest of the matrix has a maximal rank, right? So this matrix MN has maximal rank of n. And what we ask a question, if we apply a lambda to this vector field, you see this uh, vector field, it does not, it, it is expressed only in partial wise. C is in these coordinates. It means that it's multiplied only here by, by this matrix. And we see that this vector field do not look at the coordinates of this vector field right now. We, they do not actually matter for this moment because we if apply a lambda to this vector field. We uh, get that this matrix multiplied by vector field is zero because this is zero, right? And if you have a matrix with a maximal rank, rank and um, you have a system of equation which all the all of them are zero and there's only one solution because the rank is maximal right you have only zero solution we've already used this trick several times in the proof of thompson theorem but it's good it's a good thing to remember it's simply linear algebra right like the simplest case is when you have a square matrix it's non-degenerate, it has maximal rank, and if multiplied by a vector and gets zero, it means that uh, the vector itself is zero. So we get that this vector field is uh, vanish identically because we have that this formula uh, holds in the entire neighborhood. Okay, if it holds in the entire neighborhood, we see that all these uh, mm, partial derivatives, they vanish identically, which means that N, in fact, does not depend on x, it depends only on y. So we have an uh, operator L, here n depends on y. Now let's go back to the things I have already mentioned. We do have uh, uh, conditions to define a quotient operator. You need to ensure that the quotient, uh, to define, uh, define a quotient operator, you need to ensure that first it preserves uh, the uh, distribution right? In our case, it uh, operator preserves this uh, distribution, the smaller one, the spanned by the, uh, the partials in Ys, because this is the distribution of this part, right? And it preserves the distribution. And it also, we know that this operator, it also um, does not depend on other coordinates. In our case, this is only x. So we see that this operator is a good quotient operator, right? So it um, allows us, it, it, we, have, uh, we can uh, take one dimensional distribution, we can take a quotient space, it will have these coordinates, and these coordinates, in these coordinates, we, give, we have a good quotient operator. And this operator is Nienhuis. And it has smaller dimension, right? So we took a dimension n plus one times n plus one and reduced it to the dimension n. Okay. By induction assumption, we may assume that uh, the, this quotient operator it's in a good uh, in a good form, right? So uh, that is what we have here. This square, if you look, this is the quotient operator in good form. In, a, in particular, we get the lambda, it depends on uh, uh, yn on the, on, on the last coordinates. It is, uh, we get this by induction assumption. Uh, we see that uh, the problem here now, we almost killed, we just did a significant step. We started with diagonal, with upper triangular form. Then we assumed that uh, this induction and we did a great job. We killed almost all the terms except first uh, row this row, 
with M, and the last column in G. Again, taking quotient operator. So we started with dimension two. In dimension N, we first uh, took the one-dimensional distribution of kernel. We took a quotient operator. It turns out it exists. And we took the normal form of the quotient operator and got the operator like this. Now the, the other step, see, this is, this is the step three. It, this operator looks nice. And now we can see that, uh, well, actually now in, in, in this form of the operator, we do have another uh, invariant distribution. This is the distribution which is spanned by first n vector fields coordinates. What is this distribution? Well, this distribution is simply the image of L lambda. If I subtract all these lambdas from diagonal, we'll see that this is exactly the image of L lambda, right? So uh, we see that this distribution is integrable. And what we can do, what we can do is we can restrict the L onto this distribution. Okay, so we, st we did a quotient operator. And now we do the restriction. A restriction like this. Okay, uh, we can do the restriction. We see that the good thing about this um, uh, distribution that we already know, right? Because we have chosen the coordinates uh, right, because we do have, uh, we did uh, our preparation. We know that the leaves of these coordinates, they are just uh, yn equals constant. So if you take uh, this leaf, it will be n dimensional because we have n plus one dimension. And this will be exactly the invariant leaf of this block. So that's what we do. We take this leaf. Okay, we take this leaf and we get the following coordinates. There, there we have uh, one less coordinate. The restriction, which is fun, the restriction of L, we denoted L1. And uh, it is a new separator, as I mentioned before, right? We've already applied this uh, trick. And, um, but most important thing is that after we restrict L1, uh, after we restrict L onto the distribution, we get an um, operator field with constant eigenvalues because see, that's the just, it is, it is the definition of the leaf. We just need to take lambda n being constant and thus we get the leaf, right? Which in turn implies that we do have a, a constant eigenvalue. Okay, that's what we do. Now, if we take constant eigenvalues, now we need to, we need to carefully get rid of these uh, m's, right? That's what we we are trying to do. So to do that, to do that, we take a look at l1 lambda. This is l1 minus lambda times identity. We have the first column is zero. Then uh, this operator is again will is co quotient operator because we can do all the calculations again, or we can look at Thompson's theorem. We've already did that. And we know that by Thompson's theorem, we this operator is uh, has constant eigenvalues, and thus by coordinate change, it can be brought to the constant form. The thing is here, because we do have a quotient operator, this coordinate change, it involves only y's. See, only wise. It does not, uh, it has nothing to do with M. So we, without loss of generality, we assume that we have, um, uh, we have a new operator which looks like this, right? So in our coordinates, it, this operator has, this is the first column, it consists of zero. Then we have M, yeah, this is the row, almost all, the entire first row, except with a um, with the exception of the first term. And then we have a Jordan block of uh, maximal size, it's lambda. Okay. Uh, and M is, uh, in this case, M is different. It's a one times N minus two ma matrix, okay? And this is a Jordan block of dimension N minus two. Okay. So, uh, the Ninjas, the Operator, I'm sorry. Okay, if we take uh, the uh, if we take the restriction, right? This is uh, the Ninjas operator, and uh, what we get is we get uh, the following formula. 
So we just uh, apply this operator to the basis vector fields, like these columns, get basically the columns. And we see that if we apply this uh, to these columns, uh, here's typo, we have missed the second part of your commutator, d lambda, it's supposed to be here, but still it's, it yields us uh, zero. Uh, uh, we get the following, right? This, this is killed off, uh, this is killed off, and we get that these uh, vector fields, which we denote by psi, they are commute. Again, this is the same thing we did in the Thompson theorem, only it is a little bit more complicated because the, um, the setup is different. But we, again, took the vector fields and we see that these vector fields pairwise commute. I just wrote the Jacobi condition for that. See, because uh, if you look at this formula, you will have a, uh, a vector field, which has only first entry, which is function, and all others can, uh, entries are constants. If you would take a differentiation in lambda and in y i, then uh, what you left with is uh, just probably the first function multiplied by partial x, and this is exactly the kernel. So if you apply this, this equals to zero, same thing here. We already used this in um, Thomson theorem again. So, I'm sorry, I don't know why, why it keeps happening. Um, okay, I'll be careful. So, now we're ready uh, and uh, to apply the um, technique we've already used in Thompson theorem. What we did there, if you remember, we took commuting vector fields and we said, well, if you have commuting vector fields, then you have a collection of functions. And these functions are such that uh, these vector fields uh, that's, uh, are such that they define a coordinate, uh, coordinates with a restriction that uh, half of function, like uh, part, parts, not half, like not one, one half exactly, but some of them are integrals of the um, collective distribution of these vector fields. And the others are, um, go, they satisfy this, this condition exactly, that uh, if you take a lead derivative of this function along any vector field, you get either one for one vector field and zero for the others. So we see that this function exists because this exists by a Frobenius theorem we've already discussed in, in the last section, uh, in the last, in the previous uh, lecture in detail. And we take the other functions to be wise. So this leads us to the following system of functions. See, we took df and it, um, if we apply L uh, star, it's a dual operator, we'll see that the first vector field yields us zero, uh, yields us identity, this exactly, and all others are zero, this is exactly d uh, y one. And we apply all the others and we see that this is the form we get. And thus, now, uh, the important thing is uh, this function, this function is a solution of some uh, condition, of some sort of uh, uh, system of PDEs, and but uh, basically what we see is that this function uh, depends on y n is on the parameter y, because in our case, uh, y n was fixed, it is constant, but it, for different leaves, it yields different uh, matrices like this. See, this part of the matrix, matrix does not change, but these functions, they change, they depend on uh, uh, y n. So changing them, we get changing functions f. We take one function, doesn't matter, it exists. And uh, if we take two different functions f for different leaves, we'll see that they are, sub and subtract one from another, we'll see that the difference is the function that depends on uh, one, y and only, right? So what we need to do is we just pick a fun function on one leaf and uh, from one leaf and it's enough for for us, so we have a, we extend this function right onto the entire neighborhood because the dependence on the parameter is good. And after we extend it, we look on so 
with f, right? We took f and all uh, original here fully multiply. We see that uh, after we, well, if you uh, if we go back, you will see that what is L star is just transposed of this matrix, right? What is L1 star? It is a transposition of this matrix. In this matrix, this sub matrix, which is restriction, right? You don't have uh, the last row. If you sub, uh, if you do the transposition, you will get the first uh, the column here, and there will be zeros here. But if we do you do the transposition of the entire matrix, right? You get uh, you get a row which consists of G. So basically, what we say, well, okay, you know, we did that, and keeping this in mind, this is simply linear algebra. You just transpose matrices. Uh, you get the following formulas, right? So we get that this formula holds. It's almost uh, almost this formula, but with an addition of this function because it's in the in the, in the last row. We see that this addition is the last row, and we see that the last function is still zero. But um, the most complicated addition is the first one because you take function f and you multiply it, and you have the entire row, right, in this formula. Okay. Uh, and here, look, we used that gn equals to one. It's it, it's uh, it's normal form because this is what we used here. Okay. Uh, now, I'm sorry. This happened again. Okay. okay. So this is uh, uh, this is the functions we've got, right? So uh, we we'll, we see we see now that we killed all almost all of the f, or, or, or we killed. Uh, all of the M in these new coordinates, we killed of M, those uh, M2, etc., M n minus one, and we have only last call. We also see that this coordinate change, right? It involves only first coordinate X. That is why, that is why we just rename the coordinates like this, right? We rename the coordinates like this. And you'll see that the, the, the G1, G2, et cetera, they did not change because what we did here, we didn't change uh, Y, right? Because it, it is Y. And uh, in our normal form, if you remember our normal form, but let's scroll back and see how it is supposed to look, right? You'll see that uh, uh, G, it's a very specific function, gi. It depends on xi and xn, and it does not depend on any other coordinates. In our case, this implies that after we didn't change y, so uh, they still look the same. They depend on y, and uh, they depend on y, and if you do the multiplication by... Uh, Jacobi matrix, you'll see that they also get untouched. So the functions stay the same. The only function which uh, we have questions about is the one in the square, uh, in the upper right corner. This is a G0. We don't know much about this function. We, do, we are not sure that it is in our canonical form, right? Because we have all other functions in the canonical form. We have diagonal, we have uh, ones and zeros, but we yet do not know about G, G0. So again, what we did, we started with dimension two. In dimension three, we took quotient operator. We analyzed it. Then we took uh, restriction operator. Then we analyzed it too. Uh, taking quotients, we killed everything except first row. Taking restriction, we killed the first row and we got the last column. We have uh, almost all the uh, coefficients in the no normal form, except G0. It turns out that it will give us some trouble, which is again fun, because you don't expect, well, if you look at this, one should say, well, now what we need to do is we just calculate the mean distortion, and those Gs, they will be in a good uh, normal form. Well, they are not, which is interesting. Okay, so uh, what we do, let's do the calculation again we do not 
uh, we go straight ahead and do the calculation and we'll see that uh, uh, we have uh, different pairs of vector fields, right? It is a simple exercise. Actually, it is a simple exercise, but uh, we, we don't use it. But if you look at matrix like this with a dependence like this on coordinates, then you will see that if you'll take y uh, i and y j for i and j not being n, just those columns, and you do the calculation of the Nienhe distortion, you will get that it is zero, right? Because, well, the, it's almost obvious, so it, all this vectors, they do not depend on, um, they do not have partial y n, so for them those vectors, they like constant and they commute and, and so on and so forth. So basically to call, to vanish, vanishing of this, of the Nienhe's torsion of this entire operator is vanishing of the Nienhe's uh, torsion for the pairs of vector fields, this vector field and this, this vector field and this, this vector field and this, not, not the vector fields, but those basis vector fields, which yield those uh, vector fields. Okay, that's what we're gonna calculate. This is just simple observation. Okay, we start with the zero vector field and yn, and we'll see that this uh, calculation does not give us anything new, right? We do not give, we do not get any condition on g zero. Okay, now we take uh, different vector fields one and yn we'll see that the interesting part is this, and we give the following, we get the following conditions. See, this is the part, um, uh, if we expand it, we get this uh, red uh, commutator and we expand it to see how, uh, what terms we get. And this is what we get here. We see that uh, the relation, we see that uh, G0 depends on uh, lambda uh, on Y0, in a linear way. Why? Because we know that this is a function of um, yn, this is function of yn, it means that this is function of yn, it means that it depends linearly on y0. Okay, now we take the, the vector fields, right, for, for the rest, which would go through 2 to n minus 1, and that is why we took them. Look, if we, if you take uh, this, this is what you get, right? You get 1, 2, 3 terms. In this case, in this case, you get more terms, because if you do the calculation, you'll see that uh, when it, uh, taking the derivatives of this, in terms of why we don't know if G0 does not depend on all, we assume that it depends on all coordinates. So when we take these in, in Y1 and Y0, this is what we get. And here, what we take is we take this in, uh, we take G0, we take GI and GI minus one. Because we have this Y minus my, uh, um, I minus one, we have these uh, two different terms. In this case, in the previous case, they became they, they were just one term. And because we have these two different terms, we get the following formula. This is this thing vanishes. This is exactly the condition of, on G, uh, which we had in a canon canonical form in the beginning. If we again scroll back, uh, scroll back and look at the normal form, we'll see that this condition where we define GI, it's supposed to, I'm sorry, the indices is supposed to be in upper indices. We see that uh, this formula is exactly uh, the formula which we obtained here in step six. Uh, in step six, here it is. See, this vanishes. all the variables of i minus do we have we have that g0 uh, from the previous it depends on uh, uh, it depends on y0 right we do know that it does not depend on y1 etc y n minus 2 thus it depends actually on three variables y0 y n minus 1 and y n Moreover, we know, we have already established, that the derivative 
of y uh, zero, it is like this. So after applying formula for G1, we already know this formula because G1 is a normal form, right? We get the following formula for G0. See, here it is. This is the formula for G0. It is almost the formula we need if we, I'm not going to scroll back, but if we scroll back, we'll see that for G0, it's supposed to be like this. It's almost the formula we want. But now we need to kill off this term if uh, the, the formula will become uh, the canonical form if we kill off this H, this H. So how do we do that? This is like the last step. See, the troubles with G, G0. So to do that, it's not quite, it's not that simple. It's, it requires some work. We come up with a coordinate change in the following form. We do not change the coordinates Y starting from the one and higher. We change X0 in a very specific form. And then we do the calculation. What we see here, this is the exactly uh, the formula we want. What we say, well, 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 we say if I apply in the, in the um, uh, canonical form, if I apply L star to D to the first coordinate, to the differential first coordinate function, this is what I get in terms of coordinate functions. So uh, like taking this to the to this side and introducing L lambda, we rewrite it like this. And after we rewrite it like this, we apply uh, this formula, we substitute here, open the the differentials, we'll see that dy0 uh, for L lambda, it's zero. So we get the following formula. The right-hand side becomes like this, see? This is dx1 and this dx1, and they vanish. And those two, they must also uh, be equal, right? So we take this and take this and we equate them, yes? And we arrive to the following equation. So we, again, we're doing that straightforward. We're trying to find a good coordinate change and we'll see what uh, we see. We try to, and see what is uh, the, what are the conditions for this coordinate change? What, uh, what equation must it satisfy? So this is what, this is the equation we get, right? This is the equation. We see that it looks like, again, PDE, but it's not because this is a parametric ODE. It means that R is a function which depends on a parameter we'll see that there is only one derivative in x n minus one, and the dependence of r in uh, x n, it, <coughs> it does not matter. It, is, uh, it does not play an important role. So we solve this uh, equation and we get uh, the theorem proved. Okay, there's supposed to be, uh, there is a typo here, I think, it should be those derivatives, they should be y. Yes, they should be y, and this derivative should also be y because this is this is what we, we started with, okay. So uh, it's a typo, but still the uh, it does not change the fact that uh, this function, the parametric, uh, um, uh, ODEs and we get zero and we can solve this system. It is not, it, it's not, uh, it, it is not, uh, it cannot be solved like explicitly or we write integral or something, no, but it can be solved for any H, right? And we get that uh, this is the last coordinate change to kill off uh, this last term. And we do have a uh, canonical form. We get a canonical form. Uh, the fun thing about this canonical form, if we look at it, we'll see that, well, if uh, if you assume that lambda is zero, uh, is lambda is constant, right? Lambda is constant, then its derivative is zero. And this all vanishes except this one, which is one. And you get the regular Jordan, uh, Jordan block form with a constant eigenvalue. Uh, so it is. Another uh, specific case is when lambda, uh, 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 the derivative of lambda does not vanish, then you can take the lambda to be the last coordinate and you will get xn here and all the derivatives become one. And here you get uh, only this constant multiplied by this function. It, it won't be depending on these terms, they will 
each depend on its own coordinate. If we have a, um, if, eigen, if the differential of eigenvalue does not vanish if it's not zero. So uh, this is fun. We have proved a rather complicated theorem. And now we can move to the next step. Um, so we have uh, proved the theorem and, uh, but up until now, we deal primarily with the uh, cases of real eigenvalues. Now we need to move on to the complex eigenvalues. To do that, we need a complex uh, uh, normal forms, but we can try and investigate each form on its own. But the approach here, which is uh, way better, is that if you remember, we have a splitting theorem, which says that we can split real part and um, complex part because complex part is associated with uh, polynomials of degree two in some powers maybe, but whatever. So uh, what, what we say in, in a given point that we have like a,